few announcements. First, um, be sure to check Silent Auction to see if you've won any good books. Uh, and also, um, the evaluation of the conference will be coming um, into your email boxes within a week or so. So um, please take the time, 10 minutes or less, to evaluate the conference and let us know what you think and what your feedback is. That's important for our planning. So we'll begin today with the Albert J. Kingston Award presentation. It's my pleasure to welcome Jill Kastik of Portland State University. Jill is the chair of the Albert J. Kingston Award Committee. Jill? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Jill Kastik from Portland State University. I'm the chair of the Albert J. Kingston Award. The Albert J. Kingston Award is given to honor an LRA member for distinguished contributions of service to LRA. The award committee members examine nominees' materials and look for substantial and significant contributions to the organization, the breadth of those contributions, the depth of those contributions, and the length of those contributions when considering the award winner. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce this year's committee members who were integral to choosing this year's award winner. Uh, and if you're in the audience, please stand. Kathy Shampo, Andrew Huddleston, Millie Gort, Cynthia Greenleaf, Denise Morgan, and Rob Rueda. And we have two new members who are joining the committee this year, Mark Vagel and Melanie Zock. Before we get to the introduction of the awards, I want to uh, encourage you to make a nomination for next year's award. So if you know an LRA member who is hands-on, involved, encouraging, respected, dedicated, committed, energetic, practical, visionary, participatory, <laughs> collaborative, tireless, and leads by example, there's many of you in the audience out there, please submit uh, nomination materials for the Albert J. Kingston Award. The due date is August 15th, and you would send the nominees, Vita, and a letter of introduction to me by August 15th. Uh, at this point, I want to introduce the always entertaining Norm Stahl, who was the 2013 Albert J. Kingston Award winner, and he will introduce this year's award winner. Well, I am Norm Stahl, and I am the official um, Ed Fry replacement uh, at this stage in my career. And we are here to um, handle giving a very wonderful award to a fantastic individual. And what I'm trying to do is get something started here. There we go. And there we go. But, but why aren't we a little darker? There we go. Okay. Um, actually, I'm still involved with uh, PowerPoint 101 in my own uh, life. Uh, I, I do need to get back at one thing here so I can do something. First time I've ever used presenter tools. Aren't you proud of me? <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, we are going to be giving the Kingston Award uh, at this particular time and clue number one, it's not you. Okay, so let's go to the second slide. Uh, please understand that all the captions and photos were approved by our hero. Well, actually, that's not true at all. So look for the most uncomfortable person in the room, and you will indeed know who that is already. Well, our hero was a member of the original Our Gang series, brought up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and here is his brother Carl and cousin Sandy. You know right away, right? Nope. Okay, he was a ladies' man, a stud. Now, the truth is, his mom picked all his early dates. 
Boy Scouts, you know, if you want to now figure out who he is, please go around lifting up the pant legs of individuals because he still wears Boy Scout socks and he does have a flashlight with him. Okay, here we go. High school. Look at that uh, tux he's wearing. He heard all the time, hey, have my daughter home by 10 o'clock. And he kept hearing in his own ears, you can stay out all night, drink and party. He was at Concordia Lutheran High School. He had lots of dates, and he was quite the basketball star. Um, as I said, he had lots of dates. Most were cardboard, but nevertheless, they never turned him down. Uh, he graduated in 1967, so that's another clue. In college, he was a big man on campus, Concordia Lutheran Teachers College in River Forest, Illinois. Um, note that was his trading card that was um, found in bubblegum wrappers uh, along the uh, Fox River. Um, young love bloomed while he was teaching when he and his wife taught in the same school. He still does wear that shirt. <laughs> and I swear to God, he actually gave me this one to put up. <laughs> Most of you know me enough that I would do it if I could get my hands on it, but he actually went out of the way. Uh, there will be uh, copies available for purchase later on. Um, he was a ladies' man again, as I said, that he thought it was because he had an MGB. The uh, best day of his second best day of his life was when he bought the MGB, and the best day of his life is when he sold the MGB. Uh, our hero taught middle grades, two different situations where he was. You will note this is one group of his kids. This is another group of his kids. If you look up in the upper, well, your left, students holding up a joint. <laughs> I, I, he seemed to miss it. I mean, Christ. Uh, he was the coach of the year. And here we see wearing Botany 500, uh, 1960 cl uh, clothes, and he still has the damn Boy Scout socks on. This is the one case where he didn't have those on. And look at those years, those legs, for the time he spent in Florida. He was in Florida five, uh, four years. Um, he taught, as I said, in Florida and Minnesota, four years each. He got a master's at Winona State and then went to the University of Minnesota from 80 to 83, uh, where Bob Schweiner was his advisor and Jay Samuels supervised his assistantship. There are no pictures of that time and probably that was because of his behavior. Uh, they've been burnt. So where does he go? Well, his first job is with Ed Fry at Rutgers. Colleagues were Leslie Morrill, Janet Emick, um, and they were in the Ed Psych Department. He was there from 83 to 85 and started his love of technology. He still is the only person in our field that has a Sony Beta video that actually works. His next jump was down south, and he went to UGA. At that time, these two guys showed up together, and UGA was never the same. Fact is, they are blamed for Ira Aaron leaving the department and never coming back. Uh, he was there from uh, 85 to 03. Department chair, quite adored by his faculty. They say he was the best department chair they ever had. Um, and that is something to be said when you look at this crowd. Motorcycles, bikes have been his passion. He, uh, he did, was up for the lead of Sons of Anarchy, and he didn't get it, which is for us very good. Uh, nevertheless, he is best known in some ways for going all the way from Athens to Miami for an NRC conference on his bike. Very proud of that, actually. Um, he was a member of the original Blues Brothers cover band. Now, of course, I want you to try to think of who is the masked individual who happened to also win the Causey and the Kingston Awards. Um, our hero is the author of four books, and he has more articles than there are ants in Texas. Um, LRA 
NRC highlights, these are the ones that right come to mind for most individuals, a lot of service, a lot of very important things done during his presidency. Um, here we see with a group of graduate students, um, it was a seminar, we can assume that it was a typical seminar with him uh, with bourbon. Here he is with his students from Clemson in New York City. Originally the evening started with him wearing the boa. He was RRQ editor. Uh, and here's with his colleague, dear Donna. Well, he likes to give lap dances too. Okay, he gave me this picture, I swear to God. So, who won the award? Well, I'll tell you again, it's not Harsty, it's not Hoffman, and it's not you, but please congratulate our winner, the man with the happy face, Dave Rankin. <laughs> oh, we'll get it afterwards. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get it, it afterwards. Oh, one more try. Okay. No. Okay. okay. Later. Well, what can I say? <clears throat> uh, when Jill Kastek, chair of the awards committee, contacted me to let me know that I had received the Kingston Award, I had several reactions. The immediate reaction, as you might imagine, was an honor to be considered worthy of this award and to join the ranks of the distinguished group of previous winners. When the warm glow of that initial reaction subsided a bit, it was followed by another very different one, trepidation. Why? Because it occurred to me that the previous winner always introduced the new awardee, and that previous winner was Norm Stahl. <clears throat> Those of you who know Norm well know why I was worried. Um, but I'm a bit relieved, I think. Uh, thanks, Norm, for your unusually heightened sense of moderation and decorum. <clears throat> <clears throat> Actually, Norm and I uh, live somewhat parallel lives uh, with me following on his coattails. We have both served our colleagues in the past as department chairs, me for only 10, him for 25. Uh, although we were both elected to NRC uh, board in the same year, he was already president um, in the year I was elected to that office, and now this, I follow him uh, this year. So, Norm, please, before you leave Florida, buy a lottery ticket, and, and I'll be rooting for you. <clears throat> the third reaction after some reflection was a profound sense of unworthiness, not because of any false sense of modesty or... I thought my service to NRCLRA was not meritorious. Instead, it was because it seems at best awkward to receive an award for doing something that seems so natural, natural and pleasurable. Service to LRA is as natural for me as breathing, and for many of us, including, I'm sure, all the previous uh, awardees. It is far removed from the kind of service we list on our annual activity reports and that constitute our professional chores. Someone must do them and we feel compelled to do our part. My service to NRC LRA has never been like that. It is easy to serve an organization that has been such a vital part of my professional life and has given me so much. And I've already reaped the rewards of that service many times over. Many, if not most, of my professional and deep personal relationships during my career have been in one way or another connected with this organization. And many have emerged directly from being involved in sustaining the work of our organization. But something Jill said when she contacted me about the award helped me get over this sense of unworthiness. She graciously said, you are an inspiration. In accepting this award, I can live with that. I hope my service in this award is an inspiration to all of you to seek out ways to get involved in any and every way possible. You will not be disappointed. And if you are as fortunate as I have been, you will be enriched beyond measure. 
and one day one of you may have the honor of standing here. Finally, as is customary, I think it's especially fitting to uh, thank Jill and all the members of the Kingston Award Committee. Their work is exemplary of the service this award is meant to acknowledge. I also want to thank the individuals who took the time to nominate me, one of whom my colleague Barbara Bradley is sitting with me today. It is partly uh, particularly gratifying that they thought me worthy of this award and took the time to write a letter of nomination. I wish you all well in seeking out ways to serve LRA. I wish you safe travels on your way home and look forward to seeing you all next year. And I also look forward to finding out who will uh, I be uh, introducing next year in the award. Thank you. Congratulations to David Ranking. This year, the Integrative Research Review will be a dialogic conversation about the contributions of content knowledge and strategic processing to reading comprehension. You'll notice that the room's been set up in roundtables, which is a little different. And that's because after each panelist has presented a five-minute overview of their perspective on the issue, audience members, you'll have the opportunity to discuss the issue with others sitting at your table. Following the discussion, you will electronically forward questions, comments to the panelists, and the moderator will then pose these questions to the moderator. And Greg and Ian are going to let you know how to get involved with that process. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne-Marie Palanzar, who will be the moderator of the Integrative Research Review this morning. Anne-Marie is currently the Jean and Charles Walgreen Professor of Reading and Literacy at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on the design of learning environments that support self-regulation and learning activity, especially for children who experience difficulty learning in school. She's studied how children use literacy in the context of guided inquiry science instruction, what types of support, text support children's, what types of texts support children's inquiry, and, uh, and what supports students who are identified as atypical learners require to be successful in this instruction. She served as a member of the National Academy's Research Council on the Prevention of Reading Difficulties in Young Children, the National Research Council's Panel on Teacher Preparation, the National Education Goals Panel, and the National Advisory Board to Children's Television Workshop. She was recently co-editor of the journal Cognition and Instruction, and we're thrilled to have her be the moderator today of today's research integrative review. Please join me in welcoming Anne-Marie Palanzar. Do you want to take this down? Thank you, Emily. So as we're getting settled in, on behalf of the panel, we want to acknowledge Janice Almazy, our program chair, uh, for conceiving of this innovative approach to the traditional Saturday morning integrative research review. Kind of makes sense that our program chair, who's um, well identified with dialogic teaching and the study of the consequences of that, would conceive of this kind of format. Uh, personally, I think that the panelists were brave to sign on. Um, but we signed on with the confidence that you, our colleagues, would support us in this effort. So um, you know what the focus is. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, I want to mention that in 2012, my doctoral student, Christine Schutz, and I wrote an article that appeared in Theory into Practice, in which we were attempting to respond to the railing in the literature against strategy instruction. And we asked the question, how did we get from strategy instruction being the goal of comprehension instruction to it becoming the nemesis of the attainment of comprehension? Maybe this is one of the questions that we'll find ourselves pursuing today. So the goal again of this session is to engage in a dialogue. And the session, we're a bit of um, a renegade group because we've already changed the format. Uh, what we would like to do is that our four panelists are going to provide the grist for the dialogue. 
so that we can activate and contribute to your collective prior knowledge and try to advance a situation model for which we, again, collectively can construct understanding. Each panelist will speak for about five minutes and each has actually generated a question or questions that they'll propose to frame the discussion at the conclusion of their presentations. So that's when we'll have the opportunity for the talk at your tables. Those questions will be collected via iPad. They'll be uh, beamed up here, and the dialogue will commence. So simple as that. So I'm going to introduce the panelists in the order in which they'll present. We're going to begin with Rachel Brown. This is the same Rachel Brown who made her first appearance as one of the team members investigating transactional strategies instruction. Dr. Brown is now an associate professor in the Reading and Language Arts Center at Syracuse University. She continues to study reading comprehension instruction with elementary students and was awarded IRA's Elva Knight Award for her research. Our second panelist then will be Quita Mokhtari who holds an endowed chair in the School of Education at the University of Texas, Tyler. Dr. Maktari earned an interdisciplinary doctorate in applied linguistics, cognitive psychology, and curriculum and instruction with a specialization in reading. He focuses research on the acquisition of language and literacy with students who are learning English as a second language with a particular interest in their text comprehension. Our third panelist will be Sheila Valencia, Professor of Language, Literacy, and Culture at the University of Washington, Seattle. Sheila has made numerous contributions to our field, contributing to areas of literacy assessment, instruction, policy, and teacher development. Dr. Valencia's influence extels, extends well beyond her contributions to the literature. For example, she serves on national, state, and local assessment committees, including the Common Core Standards Advisory Panel. She has served on a number of editorial boards and has been honored for her many contributions, including being inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame. And finally, we'll hear from Marin Ackerman. Dr. Ackerman is on the faculty at Stanford Graduate School of Education, and I think the best way to represent Marin is to read you the titles of several of her recent publications. One of my favorites is In Praise of Wiggle Room, Locating Comprehension in Unlikely Places, which appeared in Language Arts. But there's also Why Do You Say Yes to Pedro But Not to Me, Toward a Critical Literacy of Dialogic Engagement, and Rereading Comprehension Pedagogies Toward a Dialogic Teaching Ethic That Honors Student Sensemaking. In summary, Marin studies how students make textual meaning in conversation with others, how teachers can facilitate such talk, and what it means to comprehend text. Dr. Ackerman is the recipient of the Albert J. Harris Award from IRA and a Spencer National Academy Fellowship. So we've got some great expertise up here, and we'll begin. Wilkinson and Son characterized phases of comprehension strategies development. In the first phase, strategies were identified and then validated in terms of research. Don't do this to me. <laughs> in the second phase, these individual strategies were bundled together and then taught in tandem. The third phase was identified with transactional strategies instruction, an approach that I had a wonderful opportunity to work on during its inception uh, as part of a research team under the guidance of Michael Presley. Transactional strategies instruction definitely is a multiple strategies instructional approach, but it has a very highly dialogic component to it, and that's why we're starting with it today. Why do we call it transactional strategies instruction? Well, the transactional emphasizes the dialogical piece of it, where students are, the whole purpose of the approach is to get students to construct collaboratively, uh, high level as well as um, negotiated 
converse, uh, discussion about text. So they engage in high level discussion about text and there is no such thing as the teacher guiding or leading them towards one privileged interpretation of a text. The strategies piece comes in insofar as it's the strategies that are used to help the students come up with or construct those interpretations of text. And the whole thing is bundled together with the delivery system, which is the, uh, it's used in, in accordance with the gradual release of responsibility model. Started out programmatic research uh, that was a collaborative effort between district personnel at this particular school we were involved in, uh, as well as our research team at the Ma University of Maryland. And we did a, quite a number of qualitative studies where we looked at teachers' perceptions of uh, the strengths and the weaknesses, potential limitations of the approach. We also looked at uh, the teachers' perceptions of how effective the approach would be on their students, also looked extremely carefully at the practices that t and the moves that teachers were making during this type of instruction, as well as the acceptability of teachers first learning the approach, as well as the challenges being faced by long teachers who had been teaching it for quite a longer period of time. These studies were then followed by taking a look at the impact of transactional strategies instruction on students. And you can see from the list here, uh, there have been a couple of studies that have seen marked comprehension results on various types of measures with various types of students using various types of texts. More recent studies have focused on the challenges of strategies instruction, of getting it implemented in schools because recent or within the last 10 years, despite all the evidence that strategies instruction has benefits for students, it wasn't very prevalent in schools. And so professional development experiences were developed, one of which I was involved with, um, where was looking at easily implemented professional development, easily workable, one condition being using some published materials to support teachers and another kind of mentored after school study group. Uh, another professional development study actually took a different perspective and was saying, well, are the benefits of TSI due to the cognitive strategies instruction piece or is it due to the dialogue around the texts, okay? because TSI is kind of a kitchen sink approach where we threw a lot of stuff into it. It's complex, multifaceted, but yet we did get some nice results with it. And what was found out was that actually they do both, both approaches, um, support students' comprehension instruction over and above uh, what control students experience. So I would say that right now, Comprehension Strategies is going through a bit of a, a, a growing, is experiencing some growing pains. And that it's kind of confronting some existential issues and some substantive challenges. And I think that these are due in part to the fact that um, we run into trouble when comprehension, what is that? Hmm? Well, I'll keep going because my five minutes is almost up. Um, the comprehension strategies instruction faces quite a number of, of challenges at this point in time. One is that uh, when it's turned into, in terms of implementation in schools, a very, it's taught very mechanically, skills-oriented. Um, it's also taught separated, the instruct, cognitive strategies instruction is taught, taught separately from things like prior, the emphasis on prior knowledge, the emphasis on motivation, the emphasis on metacognition. That's when we get into trouble. I would also say it runs into trouble when a content or knowledge building focus overshadows a process focus, whether you're dealing with printed or an online text. Uh, we also have a lot more to do in terms of figuring out how to pr 
prepared teachers and support them in their teaching. A little less so on the initial explaining and the modeling, much more so on the scaffolding and also on the teaching for transfer. Um, I think we're in big trouble when the Common Core standards do not re reference strategies ex instruction explicitly at all, even though their echo underlies basically everything that's going on in the standards, and I totally un concur with what uh, Dr. Pearson was saying the other day in one of his sessions, where he's saying, how can you have kids deal with complex texts when you're not even teaching them the tools that they need to engage with them? Um, and also, I think we run into trouble when all strategies are taught to all students the exact same way, and we don't think in terms of differentiating for different populations. And finally, there's been a move recently when discipline-specific strategies have been kind of pushing out the notion of teaching general strategies. And so I'm not going to say that it's all doom and gloom right now, um, and I don't think that it's going to, the cognitive strategies instruction is going to take the way of the dinosaur um, and disappear from the scene completely, but I think it's a good time for re-examining and regrouping and rethinking where we go from now. And so I guess with a nod to Mark Twain, I would say that uh, in terms of strategies instruction, reports of my death have been Exaggerate, what is it? Reports of my death have been extremely exaggerated, greatly exaggerated. And so thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Quiter McTari. I, um, I'm a professor of uh, reading education in the School of Education at the University of Texas at Tyler. Um, I have probably the best job in the world. I'm in an institution that is mostly uh, a teaching institution, but I teach only one course a semester, and I spend most of my time doing research and inside schools, so I love the kind of job that I do. This has something to do with what I'm going to, to say about uh, reading comprehension, reading strategy, and prior knowledge. I want to share with you some thoughts about um, uh, the connections between or connections among reading comprehension, reading strategies instruction, and prior knowledge. But before I do that, I want to just three caveats. Number one, I have more slides than I can fit in in five minutes, so I'm going to go fast. Number two, uh, I'm a little nervous. Number three, my comments are filtered through my own academic background and experiences. I started into the field as a linguist and uh, as a cognitive psychologist, so to speak. And so keep that in mind as I share with you some of my comments. When I first uh, started uh, digging into reading and reading comprehension. Uh, my advisor, the late George Clare, those of you who know George Clare, defines reading comprehension as the reduction of uncertainty. Interesting introduction to reading comprehension. And <laughs> Sorry about that. So there's a lot of talk about uh, reading comprehension strategies and the need to teach reading comprehension strategies. There's no doubt 
that the reading strategy instruction has benefits, but it also has pitfalls. If I have an extra minute at the very end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the pitfalls, but I may not have time to do it. But the focus that I want to talk about is this idea of how, it, what are the ways in which reading strategies instruction is related to reading comprehension performance as an outcome, and what is the role of knowledge within that? And I'm going to suggest that prior knowledge mediates, serve as a mediator for reading comprehension strategies. You can um, teach reading strategies as much as you want, but oftentimes you could end up with kids who can read and understand what they read, but they really won't be able to remember much of it. And so, and that's not very uh, useful. So when I say background knowledge or prior knowledge, I'm talking about these four types of knowledge here. World knowledge, domain knowledge, knowledge of language, and knowledge of texts and tasks. There's a whole lot more involved in reading comprehension than just text. And I think there's a lot of, perhaps more emphasis than text than we probably uh, uh, realize. And so I'm gonna share with you three sources of support for this connection among these three uh, variables, uh, reading strategies instruction, uh, reading comprehension, and prior knowledge. One is sort of a common sense practice kind of support. I work with, uh, in a project that I'm working with right now, I work with 66th grade students who have reading comprehension problems. They can read, but they don't understand what they read. And so it's totally understandable because these, you know, when you get to these upper grades, I don't need to tell you that they, the world kind of changes for them. They're exposed to different types of texts. They read more stuff. They read more complex stuff. They are now expected to read online, and their motivation decreases, as you know. All of this is documented in research. So there, it makes sense to do something significant as far as uh, helping them understand what they read. Not just read, but understand what they read. There is a, um, a, a, a rich tradition of research in terms of the impact of prior knowledge. When I first got into the field, the first thing that I remember reading was the, um, the Center for the Study of Reading Studies about prior knowledge. And you all know about them. They're out, outstanding. I remember reading every single one of them, learning a ton from that through my uh, doctoral program. I did a dissertation called An Examination of the Impact of Content Knowledge text and Text Structure Knowledge on Reading of Complex Reading Materials. Interest, uh, never published, but I found some really interesting things uh, at, the, at the time. Anyway, um, if you look at the research, for example, that has done metacognition and, and, re and, and reading comprehension, Linda Baker and Brown, back in 1984, uh, they did the massive synthesis of research, and one of the conclusions is that the majority of the studies have shown that ineffective monitoring is definitely associated with poor comprehension, but it's not the cause. There's a connection, there's an association, but there, there's a lot more to reading comprehension than just reading, being able to be constructively responsive to what you read. Um, an interesting uh, line of research done by McNamara and colleagues at the University of Memphis, and now I believe they are, uh, she is at the, in uh, one of the universities in Arizona, is that comprehension problems exhibited by young and older readers may not be reading problems per se, but rather knowledge deficits, which can be aggravated by low cohesion in, consi low cohesion in considerate reading materials. Uh, and as you know, there also another finding from some of their research is that comprehension of narrative text tends to be influenced by word decoding for narrative text, but with prior knowledge for expository text. This is a really interesting line of research that is absolutely worth reading. And they have done uh, many, many, many studies that have basically established the same sort of finding. Prior knowledge helps make inferences. If you're thinking about reading strategies, whatever they may be, synthesizing information, uh, evaluating information, rereading, and so you are going to find yourself making inferences, and prior knowledge is what makes that possible. Um, and here's, uh, the ability to draw inferences is central. There's a lot of studies that have actually shown that, as you are well aware. 
and text cohesion. The other interesting thing is about text cohesion. And uh, McNamara's group has found some really fascinating studies, counterintuitive kind of studies. For example, low knowledge readers benefit from added textual cohesion because they lack the necessary knowledge to generate inferences. On the other hand, high knowledge readers benefit from cohesion gaps in the text because they know how to do inferences that are induced by the gaps in the text that are found in the text. So, and w what I was going to suggest to one of the models, I, um, in about 15 years ago, I had the fortune, I'll take just one, 30 more seconds, to spend some time uh, at the Center for Cognitive Science with Walter Kinch, following him around to understand his model of reading comprehension, the CI model, and it's incredible. I'm using this chart courtesy Dr. Ray Routzel, who's sitting right over there. Thank you, Dr. Routzel. And as you can see, there's a lot more involved in reading comprehension than just reading strategies and instruction. Uh, and I don't have time to explain it, but Dr. Routzel has done a magnificent job capturing it in this graphic. Now, going very quickly in, um, uh, in, in also in another field of research, uh, one of the famous uh, findings in uh, Dr. Kinch's research is that he said readers can remember a text without learning from it and can learn from a text without remembering it. And that's when happens when we teach just reading comprehension and don't pay attention to prior knowledge. Another thing that I want to share with you in conclusion, this is actually a model developed by um, Elizabeth Bernhardt in reading across languages. I read in Arabic and I also read in French in addition to English and so I'm interested in that world. And so this is how they envision, and as you can see, about 50% of the variance is accounted for by reading strategies and prior knowledge that's unknown. The other 50% uh, is split among knowledge of L1 and knowledge of L2. And thank you for going a little bit over time. not opening. It's not. It should. Isn't that it? Yeah. No, that's not mine. That's not yours. That's. Wait a minute. There's mine. There. Okay, got it. Okay, you can't pass out paper while you're in the classroom when you want to do a talk. <laughs> you know what happens. Everybody kind of loses it. Uh, I want to take a slightly different approach and um, to share some uh, thoughts that my colleagues and I have been working on some ideas we've been working on over the last couple of years when we think about comprehension and we think about the contribution of content knowledge, strategic processing, uh, to the idea of comprehension of complex texts. So I want to acknowledge uh, the first idea uh, was driven by the concerns right now about text complexity and the over, I think, over emphasis on the text as holding all of the complexity. Um, so these ideas are ideas that I've worked on with Karen Wixon and David Pearson. So that's one source driving my comments today. And the second is the last several years I've been working in urban schools where students who typically don't take AP classes have been, administer, have been admitted to AP classes um, and asked to do some serious content learning from texts. And the struggles that we've had 
trying to think about what does learning from text look like, substantive learning from text look like, and how do we facilitate that, especially for students who come in with um, some challenges in reading, some gaps in their background knowledge. Both those areas come together for me in thinking about the contributions of content knowledge, strategic processing, and other factors in making, making effective comprehension. So I'll begin by saying that what I want to do is shed some light on one interaction in that mix. And that is the interaction of texts and tasks, and how texts interact with tasks to produce more or less complexity, more or less comprehension, more or less need for certain strategies, instead of thinking about only looking at the text. So the research that underlies this is research you're all familiar with. We can go all the way back to Rummelhart, we can go to the RAND studies, we can go to um, work on assessment, we could go to the interactive models of reading, we can go to the work on learning from text that Anne-Marie and colleagues have done, Greenleaf and colleagues, Moji, Cervetti, Pearson, all those people are grappling with this issue of what it means to deeply comprehend text and the interactions that go into it. So I'm going to take you on a little journey with a couple of pieces of data to have you think about this issue and how it has implications for strategy instruction and learning from text. Well, there we go. Okay, first set of data. Let me set you up here for this. These are uh, analyses that uh, Karen, David, and I did using NAEP data. And you're looking at the results from NAEP for a fourth grade passage estimated to be by Lexile measure at the fourth or fifth grade level. In the first column, you see the different types of items, that is, the different kinds of thinking, literal recall, inferential, or um, critical and evaluative. In the second column, you see the type of item, multiple choice, uh, short constructed response, and extended response. And then you see a distribution of the the relative difficulty of items. So for example, item number one is a multiple choice literal level item, and 71% of fourth graders who took NAEP got that correct. If you look down and across, and if you believe that all the difficulty resides in the text, we wouldn't expect to see such differences in performance across the very same piece of text. Instead, what you see is that the difficulty doesn't reside only in the text. It doesn't reside only in the type of item. Look at the literal items, the inferential items, the uh, critical and evaluative items. Nor does it reside in the response mode. In fact, one of the multiple choice items is perhaps more difficult, the hardest item in the entire mix. So when we think of what makes reading difficult or easy, what makes comprehension complex or simple, Other things are at work here than simply looking at the text. Let me take you on another little NAEP journey. This graph shows three passages used in the fourth grade NAEP, which you know is field tested many times um, to make sure that the texts and the items are appropriate for the grade level. 
and you look at the lexile bands for those different texts. All of those field-tested texts appeared in fourth grade. They run from second grade reading level on lexiles all the way up to eighth grade lexile. And the percentage of easy, medium, and hard items are not necessarily aligned with the difficulty of the passage. That would suggest that, again, when we look across texts of varying levels of difficulty, we get distributions that suggest that they're all, they're all actually functioning in fairly the same way. So the question is, what makes text complex? And what contributes to text complexity? And where do reading strategies and tasks fit in? Different tasks, different levels of difficulty. The last piece that I'll share with you came from a Chief State School Officer website intended to be used to demonstrate the common core and ways of estimating text difficulty and tasks that are appropriate to be used with common core. The example shows a picture of a cover book, Wonders of Nature, estimated by Lexiles to be at fourth or fifth grade level, but they conclude that it could probably be used at the second to third grade level because of its simplicity. Okay, so hang with me a minute. Let me show you a couple pages. The introduction says, the world is full of strange and interesting animals. Some animals look unusual or have special abilities. Let's look at some of these wonders of nature. And as you would predict, the book goes on like that. The Chief State School Officer website says this fourth or fifth grade lexile could be used at second grade level because the lesson plan asks you to list the similarities and differences of the animals, or simply what are the characteristics of each of the animals. However, if you read the conclusion, the conclusion to this book says, Interesting animals come in many shapes and sizes. Their special looks and abilities help them to survive. All these animals are wonders of nature. If I were teaching this book for the purposes of deep understanding of science, I certainly would not ask to simply list the features of each of the animals. Very low-level task. If I were wanting students to learn about the science, I would be better able and consistent with the book to ask how do those abilities help animals survive? Think about the strategies that students would need to engage in in order to answer those different questions. So I conclude by asking how well, how can comprehension be taught and learned so that it doesn't overly simplify and consequently misrepresent the real work of comprehending and the meaningful learning and knowledge building, the deep learning and knowledge building from text that we want students to do? I'm reminded in closing of um, an article that Rand Spiro, Feltovich, and others did what, back a while ago, where they studied heart, spe heart specialists learning to diagnose, medical students learning to diagnose heart problems. And what they found was that when they were taught, they were taught in isolated bits. 
about different parts of the heart and how it worked. And when they got into practice, they were actually misdiagnosing and mistreating people with heart disease and heart attacks because they had never put them back together as the whole. They call it seductive reductionism. Isn't that good? So I ask here, for our purposes, when we think about strategies, when we think about content, when we think about comprehension, how can we keep it complex and still teach it and not lead to reduced outcomes for kids? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you to all of the wonderful other presenters. Uh, thank you all for being here. I want to start by telling you about a fourth grader, an African-American girl I'll call Tamika, whom I used to tutor in reading many years ago. I had already spent quite a, few, quite a bit of time teaching and researching reading at that time, and so I knew quite a bit about uh, reading and what to do with her. Um, and I, I used a handout that I put together especially for her as a reminder of some of the powerful strategies that she could use. I thought it was going pretty well until one day. That day, when Tamika seemed a bit puzzled, I pointed to the handout to remind her of the strategies that she could use. Tamika looked at it, her eyes filled with tears, and she shoved the handout away. And then she didn't say anything for a little while. When she finally spoke, she said something that I have never forgotten. Those are your strategies, Marin, she said, but I want to use my strategies. Now, it's certainly the case that I could have relied on different strategies or better scaffolding, but just focusing on those curricular decisions would miss the heart of Tamika's message. I'd like to invite us all to think about Tamika's words as a broader challenge. For the rest of my talk, I will talk through three insights uh, draw, that uh, we, uh, th three insights drawn from research and some of the questions that follow from those that we as a research community need to address if we are to do justice to Tamika's challenge. First point, comprehension is a sense-making process and a messy one at that. Texts mean different things to different readers as Rommelhart puts it, one can understand the text even if one misunderstands the author. So even a novice reader is already making sense of text that she encounters in some important way. She is doing this, as Tamika would tell you, with what she already knows and understands of the reading process and of the world. As educators, it's our job to do more than pay lip service to that sense making on the road to our own teaching agenda. Tamika's strategies, Tamika's sense-making, that's the real deal. And that ought to matter pedagogically. So I ask, to what extent and how can educators who teach content knowledge and strategic processing honor children's existing sense-making? Can we talk about teaching vocabulary without talking about a vocabulary gap, language that emphasizes what children don't know rather than what they do? And when children such as Tamika form textual interpretations that don't match ours, how can that meaning making 
become a respected part of classroom dialogue rather than something just to be fixed. Second point, what counts as good comprehension is cultural. The privileging of preferred understandings and ways of engaging with text has historically led to many readers from non-dominant groups being viewed as inferior and in need of remediation. Let's not pretend it was some coincidence that Tamika was an African-American student supposed to learn how to read from me, her European-American teacher. My ways of reading te text, my strategies, my background knowledge are all culturally preferred, just like my dialect. Tamika's aren't. And there's a fundamental injustice in that. Maybe I can't, on my own or even with a group of like-minded educators, change what culturally counts as comprehension. But I do wonder, since we can teach kids to code switch between dialects and registers, couldn't we facilitate a kind of code switching when it comes to making sense of text? Or, to put the question more broadly, can we expand what counts as good comprehension in classrooms while simultaneously preparing students for context where comprehension is still narrowly defined. How do we do that? Final point, comprehension changes over time. And importantly, comprehension is something that develops socially and dialogically. As we've heard throughout this conference, it can develop powerfully through dialogue with multiple other readers and their understandings. Many models for learning strategies and content knowledge have been initially teacher-centered with the teacher only gradually releasing responsibility to students. The students might practice strategies together, but the heart of what's considered important learning is delivered from teacher to student before they get to that practice stage. I'm arguing here that we need to bring the valuable work around instruction in content knowledge and strategic processing into deeper dialogue with the literature on dialogically organized instruction so that we can move such instruction away from a transmission model and toward a dialogic model. So how might the learning of strategies and content knowledge be orchestrated to allow children to be and become meaningful resources for each other's evolving ways of understanding text? How might Tamika's strategies and understandings be illuminated in classroom conversation as something from which her peers could learn? I don't pretend to have final answers to the questions I've posed. But I hope our conversation today will begin to move us in the direction of generative answers. Thank you. So we want to give an opportunity for entertaining at least some of these questions. And I, I also, our plan initially was to allow the panelists the opportunity to respond to one another, but you've been very patiently waiting there. So one question that has been raised um, that I think is, um, actually works across these four sets of comments. It comes from Colin Harrison, who you can count on for provocative kinds of questions. He says, a comprehension question is an unnatural act. Discuss. <laughs> I actually see interesting connections across these four uh, presentations to that question. Colin, where are you? Yep, there you are. Okay. Marin, to what extent is it the comprehension question that's getting us into trouble? And uh, how do we talk with teachers uh, about what might take the place of a question? to prompt, elicit children's thinking and engage in conceptual press. What, could, what do we talk with teachers about instead? So, uh, so I think it's a great question. Um, I think oftentimes I have seen some of the most interesting conversations happen in conversations where the teacher does not pose a question, where students pose their own questions, um, or 
Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes I've seen teachers who, who are like, okay, this part's going to be really meaty to discuss. And you get to that, it's actually not that meaty. It's actually not that interesting to students. Um, when one thinks about uh, conversations in a dialogic way, we don't, we don't presuppose what question is going, to, is going to trigger the electric spark that gets students deeply thinking, deeply engaged in text. Sometimes I have been astounded at the kinds of things that students, that students do with, with, with text around, uh, around things that I would, I would never have identified as, as important even in the text, as ambiguous in the text, as worthy of discussion. And yet students are using those, using those moments using textual evidence, engaging with each other's ideas. Um, when we talk with each other around things that we have read, it's because, it's not because somebody asks us a comprehension question. It's because we have things to say to each other. We have things that struck us, things that we disagree about, those kinds of things. And I think that is an important dimension of what we need to be doing and thinking about when we think about engaging with, with students around text. Rachel, in your, in your comments, you talked about there, it was never the intention with transactional strategy instruction that there be a privileged interpretation of the text. So can you speak to Marin's points? Absolutely. One of the major things that the idea behind transactional strategies instruction or any approach that would approximate, approximate some of those features is that the strategies instruction is not the goal of instruction. The strategies instruction and the question act asking and the teacher involvement is not the core. The core is to use the teacher as a tool, as a model, to shift the students as quickly as possible so that they're asking their own questions and that they're uh, discussing amongst themselves. And so obviously that depends, depending upon the nature of the students and the nature of the text, sometimes it takes a little longer for some students to get there. There are some students who may need initially some more explicit uh, teaching, and Duffy uh, supports this particular point of view that you don't unilaterally go in there and just start providing uh, kind of strategies instruction for all students. It should be delivered as one tool as part of a teacher's arsenal for the students who really need it. And so again, in TSI, the goal was to get those kids to start talking to each other and taking responsibility not just for their own strategies use, but the scaffolding involved also getting them ready to take responsibility for their own discussions of co content. Julie, you had a great question. We're not, we think it was a great question. We're not really sure we understand it completely. Do you mind elaborating? <laughs> but it's a question that's germane to task structure, so yes, please. The question is, when you're thinking of a performance-based task beyond a typical uh, structure, does the inclusion of a rubric or an explicitly explained about what you value as or, or what, what ideas you want to see explored in, in a text and then trying to, trying to structure tasks that actually help them engage with those. So, and once you do that, I think what becomes evident is the kind of 
instruction, the kinds of strategies that kids might use to go about it, and you and you start to have ideas both beforehand and in the moment when that's going on about how to push kids into comprehension. So I think the idea of a rubric is, is less what I was thinking about, so I wasn't thinking about it from an assessment perspective, but I was thinking about, about it in terms of how do you engage with kids so that you're simultaneously considering the text, what you're asking kids to do with the text, what they need to do to be able to do those things, and who these kids are in front of you. And I, I'm afraid that we don't often try to simultaneously look at those things. We put kids in groups, you're here, and then you have this story that you're gonna read, and then you have these questions <laughs> that, that you're gonna answer, and nobody seems to put that together in thinking about how are kids learning from text, what, or what knowledge are they building, what responses are they having? Thank you. Thank you, that was a helpful question. So, um, Janice, I think we learned a lot about how to do this. Um, and I think it was a good first try. Uh, I want to suggest to you that there will be a way to continue this conversation. We will collect some of the other comments and questions that were communicated in the course of this discussion. Uh, Ian, is that possible to do? Yes. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Janice has invited us to attempt to do some writing from this conversation, so there will be a chance to continue the, the dialogue. So, okay, all right. Will you please join me in thanking our panelists this morning? And just another round of applause for Anne-Marie Palanzar for her moderation of today's session and for all of the panelists and their insights on comprehension. I'd also like to thank Ian O'Bird and Greg McVeary for facilitating the electronic discussion. And finally, I look forward to seeing everyone next year for the 65th annual conference, which will be held at the La Costa Resort in Carlsbad, California, December 2nd through 5th. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and get some time out there by the water. Thanks, everyone.